There, a pension reform proposal that I believe will represent an agreement between uh, the administration and uh, the, the, the legislative leadership will be heard publicly tomorrow in conference committee. Uh, tomorrow, well, tomorrow is uh, the, the, the four-day deadline. Uh, it's either today or tomorrow, and it'll be, it'll be tomorrow. Uh, and then there will be votes on our respective floors on comprehensive pension reform uh, on Friday before the, the constitutional deadline for the end of session uh, occurs. And, you know, I will just say without revealing all of the details right now that the uh, package that the legislature will vote on uh, will be robust. It will be, uh, it will touch virtually every element of pension reform that has been talked about for a year or more. Um, I think that there are going to be, you know, some people, a lot of people in organized labor, frankly, that um, are not going to be thrilled with it. It deals with every piece of, uh, of the puzzle. It deals with formulas. It deals with, uh, with mandatory contributions, uh, additional contributions by current employees. Uh, it deals with uh, all of the uh, all of the abuse issues. Uh, it deals with uh, the whole wide range of issues that have been discussed and debated for some time. So yeah. see you to tomorrow. Hundred thousand cap dollar cap. There will all, there will be a cap. I'm not going to reveal the number at this point. Why there will be caps. Ca why do you think that the cap way to go is better than what you know? The governor had this 401k thing that he talked about. He talked about lots of ways to, to lop off the the higher end of all of this. Well, he, here's it's he, here's the thing. A high, let's talk about what a hybrid is, okay? A hybrid is a capped defined benefit pension and then a, a mitigation benefit above the cap that can be either a cash balance, a 401k, uh, and, and that is a benefit to workers who can only get a, the current formula-driven defined benefit up to a, a cap salary. I think what you will see uh, tomorrow um, is that um, there won't be a hybrid uh, and, and, and thus not the compensating benefit for employees. So it'll, it will just be uh, a cap and uh, for both miscellaneous and public safety workers. So the, the hybrid gets a little misinterpreted, I think, sometimes because what we were discussing or debating, if you will, with the governor at around the middle of July was what type of hybrid. But no matter what type of hybrid you're talking about, that program, whatever it might be above the cap, is a benefit to employees. And if it's not part of the package, there is no compensating benefit to the employees. So it's there's just nothing above the cap? I, That's well, what you just said. That is what I, I must have just said that. Yeah. Yes, no I must have just then. said that. What's that? No cash balance plan then. I, I don't think there's going to be a, there, you know, unless something changes, there's but, not going to be a hybrid. But Darryl, yeah. do you think that's yeah. enough for people who say six-figure pensions are too high? Can I tell you? you, you um, if the, the phrase, if, if, pension if the goal, if the goal here is to please the ideologues, the people who do not believe in defined benefit pensions, uh, then you know, of course, this package isn't going to. Uh, meet with their with their applause or acclaim, but if you if you believe in defined benefit, um, and you're serious about creating a system that is affordable in the long term, sustainable, while maintaining uh, respectable benefits for public employees, then um, I think you will see that this is th this will be a very successful effort. How much money will it save? We don't have that analysis yet, but it. it uh, ten, in the tens of billions of dollars. Um, is, does the November tax measure for the governor, does that play a role in how tough you have to be on unions? You know, I don't, I don't look at life that way. Um, I think that we had, a we had and have a responsibility to pass comprehensive pension reform that uh, demonstrates to the public that we are doing everything we can to rein in costs where in the long term any program is not affordable or sustainable and I think we will more than meet that test.
Joe, what time do you support KB5? Uh, yeah, I, I do with some um, real amendments and uh, some additional amendments actually beyond what, I don't know if it's in print now, but what will go into print. Um, there is a case out of uh, Southern California involving the Los Angeles Unified School District, which says that the district must have as part of their evaluation process measures which link state standardized tests to teacher, uh, to teacher performance. Um, I, I will support AB5 with an amendment and a set of amendments that conforms to the, uh, to the judge's decision in that case because what that will mean then is that while the, the issue of what percentage, for example, test scores ought to be as part of a teacher's evaluation is negotiable, it will be mandatory in the state law that test scores themselves, test scores themselves, standardized test scores, must be part of a teacher's uh, uh, evaluation. With that, um, with that, with that change, um, I, I'm, I'm uh, prepared to support the bill. Yes. Is that the only change they're talking about at this point is adding that in? Because there's certainly that's yeah. just one criteria. Well, but that's the that that is the biggest that is the biggest issue, right? The the, the look at you got some polar you got some. Let, let's take the positions here. There are some on one side who would say none of this should ever be bargained. Districts should be able to just say test scores should be 20, 30 percent of a uh, of a teacher's evaluation. That's not my position, because I must tell you that. Um, while I believe in, in the relationship between those test scores and the, and the teacher's evaluation, nobody can tell me and can tell anybody reasonably that it ought to be 10, 20, 30 percent, or frankly, how the methodology should actually be done. We're not that advanced yet on these, uh, on, on these matters. Then there are those maybe on the other side who would say under no circumstances should test scores be part of a teacher's evaluation. That's not what AB5 will look like when it, uh, when it hits the Senate floor. There's a middle ground that is a solid middle ground that says, yes, test scores must be part of a teacher's evaluation and state standardized tests, but that it is up to the district and the union to negotiate not only the percentage, but all of the other factors. Look, at my view is these issues I know get are highly politicized, but you need the buy-in of all your stakeholders if you're going to make an evaluation uh, system and process work for everybody. So I think that's, you know, it's all about, you know, uh, going down the middle here and trying to find um, a fair result. And I think if, uh, as we amend the bill in the way that I just described, that would, for me, uh, constitute a fair result. Gerald, can I just go back to pensions, just circle back on something? Make yes. Sure we understand it. Yes. When you were asked about cost savings, and you said tens of billions of dollars, over what time frame of that? And, and as, a, as a second part of that, uh, will we see a cost savings analysis tomorrow? I don't know that we will tomorrow, but certainly by Friday, because uh, once the, the language is final, then what we will do is we'll ask PERS, we'll ask uh, to to uh, do an estimate on the cost savings that will both answer the, the whole dollar figure and over what period of time. So how do you believe tens of billions and where does that? Well, that, that, that is based upon um, some earlier estimates based on some of the preliminary work that we had done prior to July. Mm -hmm. Which uh, what universe of time? Over the course of 20 to 30 years, I think is what we're talking about. Do you support the linking of the fire fee to the middle class scholarship, and do you see it playing out here? How do you see it? Uh, I, I do support it, um, because I, I think that um, the middle class scholarship would be a great achievement uh, for middle class students and their families here in California. And to me, it's, you know, cost benefit. It's true that it would cost, uh, you know, the general fund something. Or, or it would reduce the amount of the single sales factor, mandatory single sales factor benefit by buying out, if you will, the fire fee. But I think the offsetting benefit, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars 
for uh, the middle class to be able to afford to go to our public universities is worth it. Is that enough that to get, get it in? Yeah. Is that enough to get it to, to get the votes? Yeah. You need to talk to uh, Mr. Huff or Mr. Bassett or one of those folks. I, you know, that that I, we know that the AB fifteen hundred is a two thirds vote, and uh, I know that I'm going to work hard to, uh, with the speaker and to help the speaker try to get that done. But I don't know where those votes will be. Well, there, I, I understand that there is a 98 issue, and uh, you know, I, I think the speaker is trying to deal with that. But look, at um, you know, we ended the fiscal year. Correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin, but we ended the fiscal year a billion dollars above projections. And right now, right now, the single sales factor is elective, and we're out the billion dollars. I mean, the schools aren't getting that money now. It's all going to out-of-state corporate tax breaks. So if we can go from elective to mandatory, you have a new billion dollars. I support the idea of trying to take that, you know, uh, as much of that money as possible and providing some benefit and relief to middle-class students and their families. But it's a two-thirds vote, and so we just have to see on 1500, so we have to see where it goes. I mean, I... Uh, what about workers' compensation? You have a bunch of workers protesting today. Do you oh, think yes. history is going to hurt their benefit? Are they right or are they wrong? Uh, so let me, let me give you my uh, perspective on workers' comp, which is another one of these. I'm sorry. You're backing up. That's okay. I apologize. You're that's afraid of we don't want to. There we go. Here off. we go. Go ahead. This is my view on workers' comp. Uh, while involved in pensions, I also have spent uh, a number of hours over the last days looking at this and working on this. If we could get a workers' comp agreement, even in the last days of session, that increased benefits for injured workers across the board, we ought to do everything reasonable to try to accomplish that. Here's the one catch for me. We need to make sure that the savings we gain in order to pay for that benefit do not harm the most severely injured workers who under the current imperfect system are able to get um, appropriate but significantly higher awards because of the nature of their injuries and the difficulty they will have in ever getting back to work in many cases at the salary or comparable salary to what they made when they got hurt. And so my sticking point, if you will, is to ensure that we don't do anything that is going to to take that cohort of workers and uh, reduce their benefits in any kind of a significant or dramatic way below what they are able to get now in order to part in order to at least partially pay for the across the board benefit increase so uh, especially once we're done with the pension thing in terms of the conference committee all that, I'm probably going to be close to full time uh, on workers' comp. Because if we can get a across the board benefit increase in the right way, I'd love to do it. Is that? Thank you. Why so last minute on pension reform, though? Come on, it's the last week of session. It's so important. Well, the end of session is the time, as I said, I think two weeks ago, of great Great peril, but also great opportunity. And look at it, it's an old adage, but it's sometimes, you know, uh, the, 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 the big cases settle when you're on the courthouse steps. I mean, it sometimes take, it takes the pressure of the end of session sometimes to complete, to complete, and that's the key word, uh, the hundreds of hours of work that have already been spent. And let me just say, if, if the, the one thing that I would maybe disagree with a little bit in terms of, is that, you know, there have been I don't know how many, but there have been public hearings, hours and hours of public hearings all year on this, going through a lot of the detail in the subject and the subject matter. So the main thing is, is that we get it done and that, and that people see it for what it is, which is uh, real and serious pension reform. Will okay? The, will the change retirement ages apply to current employees, the new retirement ages to current employees? No. Sorry, say that again, please. Will the changes in retirement formula in terms of ages apply to current employees? No. 
that would be violative of the Constitution in our view.